we had long conversations about bringing Kenny Smith back because he's a fantastic podcaster and Doctor Who journalist, but time and society and culture and taste has moved on. And there's a problem with the Kenny of old in that he's a podcaster who is Scottish. And I had problems with that. And a lot of us at the Sirens of Audio had problems with that, of associating podcasting with Scotland. And trust me, there is a very long tradition of this. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, I know you've been driving all day long, you've driven back to Sydney from Queensland, you must be feeling so up to podcasting right now. Oh, I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing after a nine hour drive all the way down <laughs> the coast, but it's at least a lovely drive now. It's good to know you're dedicated to the Sirens of Audio, Philip, so thank you for that. Uh, joining us also, after too, too long a time, we say this every time, but it's too long a time, it's uh, the man himself, Kenny Smith, is back with us. Good day, you flaming larrikins. Good day, uh, no, no, just don't, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, Kenny, good to see okay. you. And you, you great la. <laughs> how have you been keeping? How, how was the 60th anniversary Doctor Who year for you? Tell us all busy. about it. Very, very busy because... Obviously, plenty going on with Big Finish and lots to go in Vortex. And then having sort of put one of my podcasts, The Power of Three, in hiatus back in 2022, decided, oh, maybe just do a couple more episodes in 2023 and then get started. And then it turned into one a week. And then throughout November, it was one episode a day with uh, different book authors and dropped in some audio stuff there as well, getting a look at some of the Destiny of the Doctor series for got some authors on to chat because there were never any CD extras in those and spoke with John Ainsworth as producer. So we did that and yeah, lots of stuff going on. Of course, plenty of stuff on TV as well to, to keep us all entertained. So yeah, I've had a busy year and, and then decided to do eight episodes of The Power of Three as well. Sorry. And I meant uh, Pieces of Eighth. That's the thing. When you do a podcast that starts with a word with P and ends in a number, uh, it's a bit of a pain. So yes, um, yes, did a few um, pieces of eight as well in the run-up to the anniversary. So yes, no, it was run-up to Christmas. God, so, see, that's how busy I've been. I can't remember what month it is. Am, am I Kenny Smith still? I think so. I don't think I've turned into David Tennant, have I? No, nope. just checking. <laughs> no. But yes, busy, 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 guys, and thank you for asking. And again, thanks for all your kind words and support when... We always um, say nice things about episodes when we, we do get a chance to catch up. So thank you for that. Our pleasure. Our absolute pleasure. Now, today on the podcast, we're going to be doing our annual best of Big Finish for the previous year, which is 2023. And the output hasn't slowed down from Big Finish. There is lots and lots and lots of stories to talk about. We cannot possibly talk about every single one of them. Um, normally... Philip, you'd be pleased to know we we jumped down the rabbit hole, but we probably won't today. Are you happy with that, Phil? You got to leave me alone. That'd be good. Yeah, I'll leave you alone today. Kenny might be disappointed with that, but we might just get mm. straight in. And we're going to do uh, our favourite. Can I say a top five? Because I know Philip, you don't you don't believe in ranking, um, and I'm not really ranking the stories either. I've picked five, but they're in no particular order either. Uh, and Kenny, I know you've picked five too. And we might talk about a few um, uh, notable other entries as well that didn't make our top five lists. So I guess, Kenny, if we go straight to you with your number five. Okay. I'll go with, it's a Torchwood release that I particularly enjoy by uh, Lauren Mooney and Stuart Pringle, which was Dog Hop, a very unusual story where we got... Uh, Torchwood investigating a case where people think that people have been dogs and human have had their bodies swapped around 
and it's a very very dark but also darkly humorous story and for me it's one of those ones you just think what and it was all based on an idea that Stuart and Lauren had had because are and there were times when they thought that the barman who was in charge of the place was swapping places with his dog. And it's just one of those bizarre notions, sort of like, you know, what it's like, you, you make up a running joke amongst yourselves when you're at work. And lo and behold, they've taken this wonderful idea and turned it into a Torchwood story. I mean, it's not exactly the sort of thing that you'd be able to do with um, a Doctor Who one particularly, but in this case, we've got Tom Price as PC Andy investigating and uh, a bar manager who's thinks that there's something strange going on. And it's just wonderfully, wonderfully dark. And what a twist at the end as well. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil it, but my goodness, it is a great one. It's dark, it's funny, and Tom Price is just in top form in this throughout. He's always in good form, but just that, that sort of like PC Andy, desperate for love, wants to be loved, so much love to give, and never quite finds it. Instead, he finds people swapping places and minds with dogs. And it's Lauren Mooney and Stuart Pringle of uh, becoming more and more regular with uh, with their Torchwood releases, and uh, usually those real twisted type of stories. So uh, they they look like they're not stopping along that front. Definitely not. I mean, their first one that they did uh, with the the horse uh, going round in Wales at night. I mean, the first time I listened to that story, I was out for a walk, and it was dark, and it started snowing. And it was just the perfect, the perfect weather for it. And just, you know, a bit of a wind built up and because I needed to go to the shops and I wanted to get a bit of exercise in after a long day in the the home office. So it was just, you know, just absolutely, it's what the story's all about with the Mary Lloyd, a horse going around and knocking people's doors. And yeah, they pay them absolutely, they're perfect for Torchwood, that sort of darker side of things, but with a hell of a lot of humour in there as well. Very good. All right, Philip, what about you for your number five? Okay, well, as you know, I'm not ranking my one to five. <laughs> I'm just I've, doing I've, a countdown for our it's a <laughs> countdown for the purposes of the podcast. That's all. So, not so you can edit, edit, not a ranking. So I, I've just chosen five. So I'm, I'm actually just going to work through the year. Um, five five stories that have touched me or affected me during the course of the year is what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm going to start off with the Eighth Doctor because can I just say the Eighth Doctor had a sensational year all year. Um, I, there wasn't a data story that came out from Paul McGann and as always his performances are great. So I'm going to start at the very start of the year with Cass. Um, so the box that came out at the very beginning was called Cass. Um, people would know that Cass, um, was that character who lasts about three or four minutes in the Night of the Doctor special, for the 50th anniversary, 10 years ago. Um, and she was, it was amazing what the impact that whole was it, what was it, 12 minutes long, 15 minutes? I don't know how long that's, that little episode was. But Cass really made an made amazing impression. And she was like, a, yeah, she was the companion we never had and never had her. So big finish. And through the joys of the time war and the muck that the time war is making up, um, it was just great to have Cass back and her and Pum again work so well together. So three stories. Um, Tim Foley did, did a great story. Lou Morgan and James Moran. Um, James Moran did a double parter. Um, I won't say too much about it. It's it is time war, and so Paul McGann's Doctor is a bit bleaker and sadder and weary than later on. Um, I think other people are going to recommend some stuff from towards the end of the year when he's back with some new stuff, um, where he he's back to his cheerful, fun, original self. But I'm still enjoying this performance. But it's a very different performance Paul gives in the Time War series. Astoundingly different. And, and he's just old and weary. But anyhow, Cass really lightens things up. And some, yeah, some very clever ideas. The Time War's playing well. And the writers have all managed to capture the idea of the Time War uh, and actually incorporate the stories really well into it. And just, yeah, just great performances all around. So, Kenny, as the resident Eighth Doctor expert... Would you say that the Eighth Doctor's got probably the biggest character arc of all the incarnations of the Doctors? What's your opinion on that? I would say so. I think that, as you mentioned, he starts off younger when he's bubbly and adventurous and sort of shaking off the shackles of all the 
seventh doctor's machinations and his plotting and such like and here he is he's young he's carefree and out there and having fun again and very much so and because we know how his story ends and when his time descends into into war and how does the eternal optimist survive in wartime with difficulty and i think that you know as you mentioned Cass is such a great box six and Emma, jo- Emma Campbell Jones is just so so good. She is mm. half Scottish on her father's side, and uh, <laughs> which is a, an absolute bonus. But yeah, she's great, and you know, bringing back Sonny as well as Alex is it's a great great pairing. And fingers crossed for more of that in the near future. Excellent. I might go to my uh, number five pick, and it was an early one from twenty twenty three in January. It was an audio novel and Kate Allman's The Dead Star was released that month. And my reason for choosing this was uh, because there was a lot of anticipation when it was announced that Kate Allman was coming back to write Doctor Who. She'd done a few different things, bits and pieces over the years for Big Finish, whether it be Blake Seven or short stories here and there. But this was her first sort of audio Doctor Who release I think ever because if you you walking to Babylon wasn't uh, wasn't really Doctor Who was it that was a Benny um, and that wasn't that that wasn't adapted by her either yeah yeah it was written by Jack Rayner so so this was highly anticipated and I, you know how much I love the Second Doctor I think the Second Doctor is very underrepresented in the Big Finish catalogue uh, but every showing that the Second Doctor got in 2023 was a great one and this. This is a great story. The audio novels are an interesting animal. You've got to kind of invest yourself in these and view them as a book, and you've got to put aside time. If you want to get through them uh, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time, you, you can't try and do it all in one go like you can with other Big Finish audio releases. But the way they've set it out, they virtually set it out in episodic form. So this would be a six-part, and the parts go for about 90 minutes each. So um, what, what does that make it? Anywhere between between seven and nine hours to get through the whole story. But Michael Troughton just does these characters so well. Um, it, it's very timey. It's a very timey-wimey story. It's about black holes. It's um, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit spy-fi as well in certain parts. Uh, there's some car chase scenes in there that are, that are done really well. There's one character in, a, in particular... Um, that is, I, I, I haven't heard it since then, so you'd have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the character is gender fluid. So it starts off in a certain way at the beginning of the book and the same character is portrayed differently, expertly by Michael Troughton in a different, in a different way uh, towards the end of the story. And uh, it's, it's not explicit that it's the same character and you sort of, you come to realise that it is the same character and it's, Michael Troughton's done such a good job with that and Kate Orman's writing is uh, is superb. I think this is great for anyone who is a fan of the the, the Virgin novels, because uh, Kate is one of those authors that is always talked about still to this day. I think there's a bit of a nostalgic uh, return to those stories in a, in a lot of fans at the moment, uh, looking back on the wilderness years, um, because I think those fans that are just slightly younger than us, Philip, who were, who went through the '90s and the wilderness years, are are starting to do podcasts, talk about all that era, uh, even though you and I weren't in in that era so much. Uh, Kenny, you might have been more than Philip and I, but um, yeah. So it was great to have Kate there. Looking forward to to more from Kate. If there's more coming from Kate from Big Finish, I'm sure there is. That there was such a, uh, a a groundswell of support for for Kate, and it was great to be able to to talk to Kate in person about this. She came to. Uh, one of our recent events with uh, only a few months ago, um, Katie Manning's event, I was able to have a chat with her about it. And she was really touched that so many people were approaching her and uh, remembering her. She had no idea that people remembered her from all those years ago. Cause keep in mind, it's 30 years since she wrote the novels. Um, but there is a lot of love for Kate Allman and long may it continue. Mm. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agrees, and I'm not just saying that because obviously I, uh, she's one of your fellow Aussies. No, I think she's she's wonderful. She's such a talent, and I was there buying the new adventures in the nineties, and carried on obviously with the EDAs, you know, getting them all as they came out, you know, excitedly. And I've said this elsewhere recently that, for many ways, Doctor Who fandom became like a book club 
before book clubs were a big thing where we'd be getting together and we'd be discussing the latest book in the pub. Um, I, I will give you a quick Kate Orman story. She came to the UK in the summer of 93 and she came to Edinburgh and she came along to the Edinburgh Doctor Who group. And because it was summer, I wasn't at uni, so I was back in Glasgow. So I wasn't going to go through just you know every Monday night. I was a student. I didn't have a lot of money. And uh, she was there. And, uh, this was uh, just that before. I think it was just before the left-handed hummingbird came out and she mentioned the title of her book. And my friend Brian was long. Brian's very much a traditionalist in Doctor Who stories and Doctor Who titles. And he heard the name of the book and he was saying, he was saying oh, no, please, you can't call it that. Oh, no, please. Awful name. So, yeah, Brian was never a fan of these sort of more out there titles. But, yeah, Left Hand of Tummingbird, great book. I mean, what Kate did was, I mean, like Paul Cornell, brought an awful lot of heart and humanity to the, to the books. And I think obviously people recognise what Paul did, but Kate's often overlooked and wrongly so because of what she did and what she brought to to the range. And uh, yeah, wonderful writer and uh, a lovely, wonderful, warm, funny human being as well. Yeah, she and is, also, definitely. this is such a great release. Um, you know, Doctor Ben and Polly's story, and yeah, so much complexity to it, and it's it's a good one. It's like you say, you cannot listen to these in short bursts. I mean, I like to have the audio novels for my morning walk so I can sort of like time it and do an hour at a time. I mean, on my phone at the moment, I've got the uh, the most recent one, uh, which is prior to about, hang on, I've given the wrong one. Um, I've got the Box of Terrors. I've still not completely finished that. Uh, I've got an hour and 29 minutes of that left to go. And yeah, I I look forward to concluding it. There's such a, such a great range and, you know, deserving of your attention. Absolutely. And, not only is it we've mentioned Michael Troughton, mentioned Kate Orman, but also Steve Foxen, very important as well uh, as the sound designer because these are audio novels with sound, so they're enhanced audio enhanced. novels hmm. um, and very, very integral to, it's not just a straight audio book. Uh, so Steve Foxen, big shout out to him for this uh, particular book too. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, the audio novels, The Dead Star. Polly and the Doctor walk through the deserted campus, past the brushed concrete buildings, heading for the tube station. The balmy summer evening was spiced with the smell of freshly mown lawns. Doctor, said Polly, if I ask Dr Fields to tell me what a black hole is, she'll never stop telling me. So would you mind explaining it, preferably in words of one syllable? The Doctor said, well, I'll try. You see... A black hole can be created when a very large star reaches the end of its lifespan and goes supernova. Now, a star is tremendously massive. Earth's sun weighs about an octillion tons. When a star's furnace goes out, there's nothing left to hold the star up against its own enormous weight. He mimed a ball with his hands, bringing them suddenly together. The dead star collapses in on itself crushing all of its matter into a tiny space. His right hand became a tight fist. The closer you get to it, the more intensely you feel its gravity, until it's so powerful that nothing can escape its pull, not even light. That's why it's black, said Polly, a little bit awed. Out of the corner of her eye she saw a large dog crossing one of the lawns. When she turned her head it was gone. She said, so it's sort of... "'Sucks everything in?' "'Well, no. "'They're not vacuum cleaners,' said the doctor, "'pleased with his joke. "'They don't suck and they don't gulp. "'From a distance the black hole's gravity is perfectly safe, "'just as if it was an ordinary star. "'But if you go back into the black hole, "'you can never come out again.' "'Was that the dog again, passing behind them?' "'Polly tried to concentrate. "'It's funny orbit.' It has something to do with the time corridor, doesn't it? He nodded. The time corridor is straight as a die. Dr. Fields thinks her planet X is following an elongated elliptical orbit, like a comet. She doesn't have enough data yet to see the straight line. They were passing by the grandiose optics building. But, Doctor, does that mean... Between two columns, she caught a glimpse of that dog again. No. It wasn't a dog. 
An instant later, the thing skittered round the column, a thick body with multiple legs, staring at them menacingly with two black eyes. No, four. Eight? The shriek came out of Polly as though someone had pushed her down a flight of stairs. Now the monster was a hound bigger than she was, made of hundreds of small metallic parts all jumbled together, moving and changing in front of her eyes. Oh dear, it's a robot, exclaimed the doctor. All at once it was tumbling towards them. This collection of pieces of red rods and gold chains and jagged silver shapes galloping across the grass so lightly it left no trace. But there was a parked car in its way, and it leapt onto it, crumpling the roof like foil. Oh, my star! shouted the doctor. Polly was frozen in place. The moment he grabbed her arm, she turned to run with him, even though the robot man-dog was racing down the road only a few seconds behind them. Only one second behind. It was on them! Big finish for the love of stories. All right, Kenny, let's go to your number four. Yep, and I like, obviously, these are not particularly in any order. They're just sort of or ones that I've chosen. Um, and for this one, I've gone for a sixth Doctor box set, Purity Unleashed, which I, just, I got the first, I'll come out in May, and I got my first idea of what this was all about in February when I was chatting to Matthew Sweet at Gallifrey, and he was telling me all about Broadway Belongs to Me and the fact there's a, you know, there's a musical number in there and the fact you've got Mel can't dance and the doctor's the one who's got to teach her how to do it, which you're just sort of, you know, in real life, of course, we all know what Bonnie Langbird's a wonderful dancer. We had her on The Masked Dancer over here rather than The Masked Singer, the, the, the dance version, and she was on that squirrel. She was wonderful. And it's just such a funny, funny adventure. And for those who are interested in football or soccer over here, it's got the former Celtic and Leicester City manager, Martin O'Neill, popping up very briefly for a line near the end. And he's very, very amusing in that, um, which was, uh, I thought was quite good. And yeah, it's just such a funny release and kicks off a really good box set as things get darker as we go along. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed you know, the introduction of Hebe and particularly in this set, uh, Hebe's gone missing and the, the Doctor Mel are trying to find out what on earth has happened, what's changed history, what's removed her from this. And it's just a fabulous, fabulous mix. And particularly when you bring in um, an actress as brilliant as Imogen Stubbs, who's Patricia McBride, and she's just so, so good. I mean, I've been a big fan of her since the early 90s when she was in Anna Lee, which is like a detective show and she just has such a wonderful cold edge to the part of Patricia and just, uh, there's a really good mix of stories. There was I mean, Time Burst, um, that's hyphenated kids, like Time Flight, and um, by Ian Potter, that's particularly enjoyable when there's a, a burst dam in the way, and my goodness, it keeps you gripped all the way. Really, really good set. Oh, and I should mention Purification by Chris Chapman as well, which is a middle story, uh, which is set in New Zealand, and uh, on the way to Antarctica, and Generally, just Chris is such a good writer for the Sixth Doctor. Anyway, and yeah, great release for me. Three damn good stories, and uh, different tones, different feels to them, but add up to a really, really strong box set. You enjoyed and, this uh, one too, didn't you, Philip? Oh, I thought it was sensational. And Broadway belongs to me in particular. Um, Bonnie Langford. Had of given course, us you like that one. Oh, I know. Well, we, well, well, for several reasons. I mean, Bonnie had given us some clues about it beforehand when we spoke to her. Um, so we sort of, so I was sort of aware it was coming, but yeah. Aside from the musical aspect, though, I think the whole um, World War Two Nazi vibe, and in terms of history, to me that 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 was fascinating as well. And you know the the whole period. Um, what's the musical? It's not Chicago. It's the other one starting with C. Liza Minnelli. Um, Cabaret. Cabaret. Thank you. Which of course is yeah. You know, Tomorrow belongs. The, the song Tomorrow belongs to me comes from Cabaret. And so it, was, it had a lot of cabaret feels to it as well in terms of the rise of the Nazis and what was actually happening politically. So I think because not you know, Doctor Who's never political, haha. Ha, um, there's a, a lot of politics in it, which I really enjoy and I thought was done in a very clever way, touching with history. Um, and of course, he be, being disabled and what that would actually mean in those situations, it worked on so many different levels 
I just thought that 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 particular script was one of the best of the year. Well, we've got you there, Philip. Why don't you hit us with your number four? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to give you my number four is I'm going to give this Robot Six, which came out in April. Robots. Um, I think people know I've been raving about Robots since it's been coming out for several years. It's taken a long time to come out the six box sets, um, which is dealing with uh, Livchenka uh, and her sister, um, and so. The the final box set came out last year, and I was really sad actually to have the final box set come out. Um, Helen Goldwyn, John Dorney, Matt Fitton wrote scripts for it, and so you couldn't have better writers. I mean, that's three of the top 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 range. John Dorney's script in particular, um, Face to Face, was just a two hander with four of them. And in fact, the recent 60th anniversary special that came out with David Tennant and um, well, the Doctor and Donna. Um, being the only two in a two, it's sort of like a two-hander. Face to face is actually very similar in lots of ways. Um, oh, look at that! You've actually got the oh, you got the book already. I'm feeling jealous. Um, so yeah, Wild Blue Yonder had some very similar ideas as well, but Face to Face came out first. John Donnie did it first, and it's just a two-hander twice over um, using those characters where they don't actually know who is actually the real live. You know, who, who, are the, who are the real sisters who aren't? And they've got to try and work through those situations where they share those memories. It's a very, very disturbing and clever script. Um, Forces of Nature is back to the whole um, politics of the place. And Matt Fitton wraps up things quite well. Um, it, it felt a bit rushed, I think, in some ways towards the end. Um, but I've really been loving it. I think the fact that we lost, you know, Pamela, well, so we didn't lose Pamela Salem, but Pamela was even in the last ones, and we did lose Powell, uh, David Collins, along the way, meant that their stories weren't quite wrapped up to my my mind way of thinking as well as I would have liked. But once again, just visiting Cowdor, visiting the robots, um, and it's just yeah, um, amazing performances as always. Um, yeah, Nicola Walker and Claire Rushbrook have just been amazing. But along the way, you know, John Coleshaw is in there doing some great voices. It's yeah, the, the whole the whole release is just sensational, and I'm looking forward to now going back and listening. And I need to do this soon to all the stories in a row. So because it's often been twelve, I think it might have been twelve months before the last since the last one. There's some big gaps between them. My mind just I you know, I forget what's going on. So I just want to listen to all however many stories six or eighteen stories. Um, in a row, we'll just see how they go because I'm excited to hear the whole flow through the box set. Can I just give a, a shout out to Joe Kramer as well for the whole series, oh, uh, the particularly music. his theme for the yeah. robots? I think it just suits. I can see those silver feet marching every time. Like that theme's going through my head right now. So uh, he's he he does a brilliant job with his themes as well as his music. So shout out to Joe Kramer for that one. Beginning role play now. From Big Finish Productions, The Worlds of Doctor Who, The Robots, Volume 6. Hi. No. Yes. Two of you. Yeah. Siblings can be so different. Nature versus nurture. You can't trust anyone round here. There are weird things going on. Hi there. Good morning. Good, good morning. That is... That's definitely not what this is. There's two of me, too. Oh, wow, this is awkward. It seems terrorist activity has recommenced. She's a robot duplicate. Well, one of you is. Rollout has been scheduled. Look at today. This could be it. The uprising. D-770 to D-780. Designated security duty. The Doms are the worst. Dead eyes. Always watching you. D781 and D782. Designated maintenance. Follow. Impatience runs in the family. They're not alive. That all depends on your definition of life. Species? You're not a species. They've been evolving. There is no override. You are leaving today, right? Oh, you won't be leaving this building alive, Chenka. Liv! She's got a squadron of dumbs! Big finish for the love of stories. 
We all have somewhere that we came from, even if it's somewhere we need to run away from. What's your next we one? Are? Kenny. We're up we're to up you. Kenny. Do I, no. Oh, we're up to me, are we? Up to you. Okay, oh, I was going to say before we go, we should yeah. also throw in Escape from Caldor from Ravenous 2 as a pilot episode for the robot. Yes. So make an 18 arc into 19. Go on, you know you want to. Oh, and throw in Robophobia as well then, just to kick it off the whole thing with Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> Because that's that's where it all starts with Liv Chenker, doesn't it? With um, Robophobia and Nicola Walker just appearing as a guest amongst twenty Doctor Who fans, having no idea what's going on in the world. And and then why not throw in uh, Caldor City uh, as a sidestep as well before you start all the big finish stuff? Yeah, that's a good one too. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a great world Caldor has proven to be. Yep, absolutely. Mm. All right, for my number for yeah. my number four, I'm going to choose a fifth Doctor box set entitled In the Night. Both the Fifth Doctor box sets, I believe, were brilliant uh, for 2023. But the reason I chose this one is because it's the one I listened to most recently. Uh, so I, re I remember it the most. Tim Foley recently announced that he was uh, finishing up as uh, as a writer for Big Finish, moving on to other things. Uh, who knows? He might come back from time to time. We don't know. But uh, he did he did say that, that he was, that he was finishing up. But he wrote a, a corker of a story here in this set called Pursuit of the Night Jar, which is a really interesting one. And as I said, the, the Fifth Doctor box sets over the last few years have been absolutely great. They've got the, they're really comfortable, this, this TARDIS team. Um, if you're a fan of this TARDIS team, uh, you will be a fan of these box sets without a doubt, because it is like going back to the early 80s. Um, and... The, in Pursuit of the Night Jar is, uh, is a great look at the character of the Fifth Doctor because it's, uh, it's about meeting your heroes. And the tale of the Night Jar was a story uh, that was told to the Doctor as a boy and he always wanted to meet the pilot of this ship called the Night Jar. And things don't quite work out how they were in his imagination. So it's a, it's a kind of a story of do you want to meet your heroes? Um, so a lot of that and, you know, we said we were talking about authors and their styles recently, Philip, and this is mm. a this is a character piece. It's a, a, a character piece between the two uh, characters, the, the the captain pursuing the night jar and the captain of the night jar. That is a character piece there going on, the character piece of the Doctor. And Tegan and Nyssa and the Doctor always work well together. Uh, so uh, that, that story is brilliant in itself. I also like Sarah Grahala's, Grahala's story called Resistor, which is a two-part story. So the Nightjar story was four parts. This was two parts. Um, set in Warsaw in 1982. Bit of a rocker story. So if there's rock music in there, I always like that. Uh, but the story, of course, a bit of a sci-fi twist to it, uh, which is which is a fun two-parter. I'm starting to like these two-part stories, Philip. Um, so, well, big uh, and, and please. <laughs> and Sarah is another one who announced that she was moving on from Big Finish as well. So I don't know whether she's got any more to come or whether Resistor was the last Sarah Grahala story that is to be released. I don't know if you know about that. Kenny? I'm not sure if there are any more schedule, but you should mention Sarah Grahala, who won an award for her recent Big Finish script with Ada Lovelace in it. And one, I was reading something about it in The Guardian last night. And... Uh, just as an example, if you're a good story for women in writing and about about other women, and that that was a fifth Doctor fantastic. story as well, wasn't it? It was. That was in the first yeah. box set earlier That's in right. the year. Yeah, that was the two, that was the two parter for that one. Yep, brilliant yeah. story, brilliant, very funny. Yeah. yeah, brilliant writer, love her stuff, and in, in the night jar, in the night jar. I'm thinking of In the Night Garden, my goodness. <laughs> I was coming back for years. Pursuit of the Night Jar, great story. I mean, just such a great idea. Do you meet your heroes? What happens? And then, oops, he's dead. How on earth are we going to keep history on course and maintain his reputation? So, yeah, wonderful story and just really good interpersonal dynamics when you hear, like, the old messages between the ships that are going on with uh, Captain Eslo. And, yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful pair of stories. I really enjoyed resistor as well i love that whole sort of you know the fact there's a taxis going around and grabbing people off the streets or are they uh, which is quite like uh, matt jones's new adventure um which yeah just that was just wonderful wonderful stuff really really good strong imagery and loved it to bits 
really yep. good set. Great choice. Yep. Great artwork for that one too. Um, I, I, I love the artwork for that. Sort of makes me a little bit sad that I'm only doing downloads these days. Um, so who did the music for that? Yeah, music and sound design, Howard Carter. So he must be working on the Fifth Doctor Adventures at the moment. So, yeah, great stuff. All right, Kenny, hit us with your number three. Yeah, I've uh, gone for a story that we all thought we knew, but then again, we didn't. I have gone for Doctor Who and the Ark, as in the Tom Baker version of what became the Ark in space. And for me, it was a fascinating look at these because I always love the lost stories and where they are and what they could have been. And particularly this one, which like Dalek's exclamation mark, Genesis of Terror, getting to see something that, and Revenge, or Return of the Cybermen, to see what we were started out with and what Robert Holmes did to them. And for me, the arc was a fascinating listen because we've got this story that's very pedestrian, quite pedestrian in pace. And it does feel like it's you know a relic from the 60s and 70s, but trying to be a bit more 70s and just fascinating listens that were just to hear how mm. you know, Noah originally was and the fact there's no word in it, there's nothing like that. And it's just a completely different foe and you know, people being taken over, elements of possession where they are just possessed, not sort of physically transformed and doing the, the body horror that was to become a feature of those early Tom Baker years. And to me, it's just a fascinating listen. Great cast as well. Uh, Terry Malloy is fantastic as Noah, very very cleverly done, just wonderful performances, great music, great sound design, and just that wonderful insight. And you can see absolutely why they changed it to give us Ark in Space, but it's wonderful that we've got this sort of, you know, this lovely little timeline after robots to where things couldn't perhaps have gone. And fascinating, absolutely fascinating, these little nuggets that I'm so pleased they survive and we've managed to hear them and what they've done with them. I will say with this story, I struggled with listening to it because I listened to this in the car, and there's a lot of there's a lot of noise going on within the story that ambient noise kind of drowns out. Um, so I think the experience of this is much better with headphones rather than trying to listen to it on a stereo or in the car. So uh, that would be my one recommendation with that. Yeah, you, you, I think if people need to understand what they're getting with these stories. Um, I think some people have been disappointed thinking, well, actually, I think their purpose is a bit different just in terms of giving us a taste of what could have been. Um, you know, is it a better story than the Ark in Space? It doesn't even come close. But it is so fascinating to hear what we could have had and how much better what we have is, um, which is why I really enjoy that. The, the, the Genesis of the Daleks one, I know lots of people complained about as well. And once again, I just thought what we got, what Big Fish released was so fascinating as a piece of Doctor Who history. So in that historian sort of sense of what what what, what was actually scripted, what was actually there, was just astounding to hear. And so I, I really appreciated the three, the three that came out for that first season, just to understand better what, what we could have had, what changes were made, what were the original intentions of the original authors. Yeah, it's been very clever. And understanding Robert Holmes better, too. It's, it's They've been fascinating, fascinating pieces. Though, you know, not stunning, brilliant Big Finish stories because they're not, that's not their purpose. From Big Finish Productions, the worlds of Doctor Who, the lost stories, the Ark. Noah's Ark? Sorry, did you just say Noah's Ark? As in the animals went in two by two? But a spaceship rather than a ship. But this being the, uh, docking bay access chamber. But something's amiss. Ah. Is this it? I don't think so, Harry. It's the cryogenic power centre. Whatever that is when it's at home. It's like the cold store of an abattoir. Rows and rows of plastic bags. There must be hundreds of them. What's in those bags, Doctor? Oh, just the entire human race, Sarah. Upon my soul. What is it? What's the matter? There is something here. Shut the door, Sarah. Shut the door. Doctor, I, I don't seem to be able to catch my breath. What? Aliens? 
There are aliens in the Ark. Yes, a giant amoeba, but how did you know? No humanoids. Can't we just go back to the TARDIS? No, Harry. If we abandon the Ark now, the human race will die. <laughs> Come on, Harry! It is time to conduct the metamorphosis. If this goes on much longer, I'll end up as a puddle. Doctor, it was strange. The cerebral strobe suddenly inverted. Look, anyone there? Because if there is, I should warn you, I'm carrying a pot of boiling hot tea and I'm not afraid to use it. Oh, yes, that's what I've been waiting for. Camellias. Necessary presence. <laughs> That's not ready for you to say. Big finish for the love of stories. Okay, Philip, hit us with your number three. Yep. Um, I was so excited to have Rani come back from Bannerman Road. Um, so yeah, so my number three is going to be beyond Bannerman Road, but can I say the Wormwood as well is also amazing. Um, it is just so lovely to have the cast come back. There's, there's three stories. Um, Joseph Lidstar, who we spoke to last week, you can go back and listen to the podcast, um, did the very first story here today. It's a lovely time, timey-wimey, timey loop story, but it's also, it's his love story. We, I, I talked about the fact, because he loves big emotions. I sort, of, I sort of challenged him in terms of, you know, do you ever do love stories? And he went, oh, this is a love story. But yeah, it is actually. Um, Destination Wedding is a, an outright comedy by James Goss, as only James can write, and The, the Witching Tree by Lizzie Hopley. Um, so they really brought back, you know, once again, three great big guns. Um, Angie Mahat- Mahindra is just lovely as Rani. She comes across so much like Sarah Jane. She's, she's a professional. She's now got a podcast, which reaches lots of people. Um, and so she's the investigative journalist of today. Um, Daniel Anthony comes back as Clyde Lang in a couple of stories, which is love to hear. Um, but also, to, to me, Rani's mum being back, Gita, um, by, played by Mina Anwar. Um, she is so funny. And it's that second episode on this desert island wedding, it is just laugh after laugh. So you've got, you've got a love story to start off with. You've got a laugh after laugh in the second one. And the witching tree is actually very spooky uh, in terms of what's going on. And so as the Sarah Jane Adventures... Every two story, every story, two episodes were very different in feel as you went through each season. The box set has managed to pick up the same ideas. Um, beautifully written, um, yeah, acted is really well. Um, there's a sound design by it's a sound design by Naomi Clark, so someone actually quite new to do the sound design, which is great. And Sam Watts doing the music, so it's actually quite a new young cast. Um, so this is one, this is being produced by Emily Cook. And Emily has really come in and she's bringing in a, the young guns. Um, and so this is sort of box set is sort of the, the young guns coming in and showing what they can do. And they're doing great. I think the way they handled the death of Sarah Jane in the first uh, box set was really nice as well. Uh, they didn't overdo it, but they did it enough that it was really powerful as well, So which is, yeah. which is what it needed. It needed that transition from the Sarah Jane adventures to this. Yeah, I mean, I was a bit sad that you know Tommy Knight wasn't in in the original box set, but I think they did the right thing holding him back. Um, I think so. When they do finally bring him back uh, in Tales of Wormwood, um, they've really done a good job. And it's interesting because Tommy Knight's working for Unit, um, but he's very much he's he's the guns. He's he's you know whereas Ryan is the heart like Sarah Jane was. Um, you can still see, of course, Sarah's influence is there. I mean, Sarah Jane just permeates through the whole box set. She does, it's, yeah. It's, yep. She's she's just got this influence. It's it's yeah. You just it's it's like um. I'm just saying it's like some of the Doctor light episodes in Doctor Who. The, the Doctor does have to be there, but he still permeates. Um, they've somehow managed to write it all so that Sarah Jane permeates through these box sets, and she's hardly she yeah you know, she's referred to occasionally, but she's just there, and it's just you just go yeah. It's just it's just lovely. What they've done it's a, it's a real honor to what they've done with elizabeth sladen um but yeah and but having samantha bond she's not in enough she's only really in the last episode so samantha bond boy she, she's scottish um 
No. No. Nope. Uh, she's oh, no, she's good she anyway though. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, she's spectacular coming back. It, it has everything that you could have wanted, and it, it's a bit more grown up than Sailor Jane Adventures, but still got that feel. Yeah, Excellent. I think it's a one wonderful choice. It's it's really good, a really good set. Um, you know, a lot of heart and soul to it, and it definitely is. It's it's absolutely familiar. And the fact we've got Sam Watts doing the music, of course, did it for the TV show to give it an extra element of continuity as oh, well. Okay, so, right. Fab. Um, and I should also mention that I really like the character of Samira, who's played by Raga Char, who happens to be Scottish, but that just happens to be an <laughs> incidental bonus. You know, I'm half Scottish, don't you, Kenny? Absolutely. Good. That's why I like you too. My, my mother's Scottish and very proud to be. My mother's maiden name is McNeil. <laughs> You're Scottish. Uh, We're claiming you as well, Dwayne. Don't worry. Okay, You're excellent. Part of the love. I'm, I'm, I'm McMillan. All right, I'll go down the street and get me haggis. Is that a good accent? <laughs> that was lousy. What's your next <laughs> one, Dwayne? Going... Oh. All right, let's jump into my number three. I'm going to uh, go to a more recent release from November 2023, and I feel I don't feel very qualified to talk about this, but I really loved it. Uh, the Eighth Doctor Adventures, Audacity, contained two stories. Uh, first one written by uh, Lisa McMullen, uh, which was called The Devouring. And uh, we, this was this was the story. I remember we were talking we were talking about Joe Lister's style. Now we we're talking about Lisa McMullen's style. And we we're talking about how things that happened to her in her personal life, and she writes them into the stories. The Devouring is an example of that, uh, which was also an introduction to the character of Lady Audacity, played by Jay Griffiths, Lady Audacity Montague. Um, and... Jay Griffiths did appear in the TV series, but she didn't have a very big role, but she was in a quite a pivotal episode, wasn't it? She was in Dark Water, uh, Death in Heaven. Those were the episodes she was in, wasn't it? And did she come back for the Zygon inversion? And I thought died? she died. I thought she died in Death in Heaven. Okay. I think it's the Zygon one where she died. No, it's, it's oh, Zygon is it? In, yeah, this is Zygon inversion. She dies. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, she, okay. she, 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 yeah. So she was in a few episodes then. Yes. On TV. Well, there you go. Um, but she's playing a different role here and a very different dynamic for a character. Like the Eighth Doctor has had many, many different personalities in, in his travels over the years. And Kenny, I, I guess you'd know more than any of us being the Eighth Doctor expert. Um, but this is a, a totally different kind of companion that we've got. Um, and, and, of course, the second story written by Tim Foley, once again, The Great Cyber War. I just love the cover as well. You've got uh, Nerva Beacon, you've got the Vogans, you've got the uh, the Revenge of the Cybermen, Cybermen. Um, and uh, I I love the way the the, uh, the transatlantic, the, the, is it Christopher Robbie? The Christopher Robbie style That's accents the in there uh, as well. So, yeah, a really great introduction. And I listened to this box set. Uh, a, a couple of weeks before you did, Philip, and uh, we, were, we were actually talking to India Fisher at the time, and you hadn't heard this box set yet, so I, I knew what was <laughs> I knew what was coming at the end because obviously at the end it's out now, but um, we we had uh, India Fisher uh, coming in, so it was going to be the pairing of Audacity and Charlie uh, in the TARDIS with the Doctor for the next box set. But um, what else have you got to tell us, Kenny, about this box set? Because I'm sure you love this one too. Absolutely. I mean, it's what's not to love. The fact we've got a fantastic new companion in there. And again, like Charlie, she's from a historical setting, but obviously a, an earlier period. But she's somebody who's just got so much attitude to her, so much strength of character, somebody who's been involved in a manager of convenience, that's probably fair to say. And mm. she's just just so much going for her. You know, she wants to know what's going out there in the world and looking around, you know, through a telescope, looking up at the stars and that wonderful idea of what if somebody's looking back at you. And just it's brilliant. It's it's so well done. And then we go off to the the cyber story and we've got as you say, those brilliant revenge cybermen which are very underused on, on the TV show. In fact, I watched episode one of Revenge last night for Tom's 90th birthday. I'm sure that uh, that's a very unusual way to celebrate our 
or doctored, but uh, I would like to go for that one because I'd been sort of slightly in the mood having listened to this and thought, I need to watch Revenge again soon. And having got the soundtrack for Christmas as well, I was like, yeah, go for it. But no, wonderful character. And uh, yeah, I think um, there's a lot more to come from Audacity. And, uh, but we'll come back to her later, perhaps. Perhaps. Well, we could do, we could do. Now, the, one other thing I wanted to mention about this was the sound design by Benji Clifford. I don't know if you remember, Philip, but um, the, the opening scenes were of a, a, a drink pouring into a mm. glass. And as soon as I heard that that intricacy of sound design that Benji Clifford does best, I knew it was him straight away. I didn't even have to look at the credits. Um, and, uh, yeah, so had that trademark Benji Clifford in the sound design in this one too. Fantastic. When, when, when was this written? Do you know when was? These were done be around February last year because I know that Lisa was working on this when we were at Gallifrey because she kept having to nip back to room to try and work on it and get the script nailed down and um yeah she to there's a few things that needed sorting and uh yeah so she and she missed out on the best night i've ever had when we went to out in la with jason hay gallery which was great fun uh god that was nearly a year ago i'm so depressed and um, <laughs> yeah so so you're talking about february march last year so it was it was recorded at the end of march and early april so yeah, yeah it would have been would have been january february that they I would have been because bridgerton has been such a huge hit um, we're sitting out here in Australia. I'm assuming it's been big, it's big over there. Um, just in terms of the whole Regency period, because that's where Audacity comes from, from that that time period. So it was, it's interesting delving into a period at the moment where we feel like we know, because yeah, I said there's been what three different Bridges and series out so far. Fourth one's about to come out. It feels like we know that period. It's because it's it's been done in a way which is full of more humour. And you know it's color blind and those sort of things. Jay just fits that that category so beautifully, and she just has a magnificent voice. And um, and, and yeah, right at the end when you know suddenly we had um India Fish as well. You got Indy, you've got Jay, and you've got Paul McGann. You've got these three voices which are just so rich and so beautiful. I was thinking, I don't care what you say, the three of you just keep talking, and I'm just carried away because the the way they express, the way they speak, just beautiful. But as I said, we might come back to more of them later. Excellent. All right. We're back to Kenny for your number two, so to speak. Yep. Uh, yes, absolutely. This one is not a load of number two. This one is superb. I have gone for the first War Doctor release of 2023, which came out in May, which is War Doctor Begins Comrades in Arms, which has got three stories in it, A Mother's Love, Berserker and Memnos as we have the War Doctor reunited with Case, who first appeared in the second War Doctor box set. And here we've got them reunited, where we've got the wonderful Case, who's a partly converted berserker Dalek, but not fully completed. And obviously she, that gives her a completely in, different insight into the Time War than Doctor has in his own, or indeed the Time Lords on their own. And we have them going around the Doctor's doing his best to try and uh, educate her and as they go on these missions and they have quite a nice double act going along. And then by the time it gets to the third story, Memnos, which involves Time Lord secrets, they're separated at the end and but it's going to turn out to have tragic consequences as we discover in the sixth set in the series. And for me, it's just wonderful. You've got... Ajaz Awad is just incredible as Case. Yeah. And you know, Jonathan Carley is the war doctor. It just goes without saying that you're getting everything you would have expected from John Hurt and more. And just that youthful energy that he brings to it. And just, yeah, Jonathan is just such a gifted performer. I mean, you've got to forget, he's not just doing an impression. He is acting as well. And a lot of people, it gets me slightly annoyed when people say that they just discuss Jonathan's impression of the War Doctor. It's not an impression. It is a fully mm. rounded performance because he's getting emotion in there, getting everything in there, and it's it's just incredible. And it's he's acting, but just using another voice, and he's so good at it. And uh, I'm genuinely not just saying that because he's a good friend. He's just a wonderful, wonderful performer, and you know, I just hope that uh, there's plenty more happening away from Doctor Who worlds for Jonathan as well because he really deserves that. He's Absolutely. You, when you're listening to this, you know that you're listening to 
the doctor and he's so good at it and these are great scripts uh all of them you've got you know different things again the hybrid choice sorry that's the that's the Ajaz is one from the enemy mind series six and um, yeah you've got the opener with a mother's love by noga flesh on who's wonderful talent noga's going to be i'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from her berserker by tim x atac who's the original creator of case and here we've got a re- it's a really good sort of time war story here and then memnos film Ryan, who's a writer who I, I wish we'd get more of but he's always so busy in tv great writer and just a lot of heart and soul in this so yeah i'm going to shut up now because I, I could talk about this one for ages i just love it i think it's such a good set and we can't recommend mm-hmm. it enough yeah, when you crazy. get to the stage where you say Jonathan Carley, he's brilliant, goes without saying. It's almost like the same as uh, Derek Jacobi as the master, brilliant, goes without saying. It's incredible the the years of experience between those two, but his performance is that good that that's what we're saying about it now. It's 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 so good. So um, yeah, it's a shame that series is coming to an end too. Yes, it definitely. is. But well, it's, I suppose that's the thing. These things can't run forever, but. Yeah, it's a good. It's been a great bunch of adventures, and yeah, just uh, good luck to to Jonathan with what comes next. Mm. Absolutely. All right, Philip. What about your number two? Well, speaking of Derek, Derek Jacobi, <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw in um, the June release of the War Master, uh, Soldier Confinement. Um, Scott Hancock has been doing amazing work, and so sad to hit see him leave big finish he's you know gone off to pastures bigger and better and newer with um tv doctor who working with russell t davis and so i, I can't be grudging that but we're still getting the, the last dregs of his work for big finish coming through and i think we're almost towards the end of it now so this is one of the, his final uh things i suspect he's done uh in terms of being both director script writer producer um all around makes you sick how much talent he's got um, so he's put together this, this solitary confinement box set, which there was a couple of war, I think there's been two war master sets this year. I think this was the better one. Um, I did enjoy the stories in the other box set, but they were more standalone. Um, these four stories all have links coming together to a amazing conclusion at the end, which I won't spoil, but the last episode with a twist at the end, Derek Jacoby has is a, a Ability of making you really like him. He's warm and caring and warmth. And then he's just so evil. And it, every time he does that to me, he surprises me in terms of just as I feel like I'm getting to know him and care about him and he's poor, he's understood, he pulls a swifty. And the stories we do that. Um, Wars of Absence by James Goss, uh, Long Despair, Tim Foley, Lives and Loves of Mr. Alexander Bennett by Alfie Shaw, which is a great one, very. That didn't go where I expected to go, and the kicker by Trevor Baxendale. So all four are just um, great stories. I don't want to say too much because I, I don't want to spoil things. Um, as always, great, great cast. Silas Carlson comes in. Um, Jacob Dubman's in there. Actually, Jacob Dubman's performance. Um, yeah, Al- Alfie. Sh- I was having, I want to talk a little bit. Um, Alfie's story on the life and love of Mr. Alexander Bennett. The master's hardly in it. it. It's really a performance um, being done by Jacob Dudman, and Jacob Dudman is a stunning actor. So in some ways we're used to him playing the, you know, the 11th Doctor and doing, doing voices. When he gets to act straight, he's astounding, and that role that he plays throughout a storyline in which the master's just manipulating him and is just hideous by the end. It is such a clever story and such an, a powerful performance. Um, I don't know. I, I it's think, the standout for me for that box set. Yeah, I think Jacob Diamond could end up doing anything in terms of acting. I, yeah, I, I'm hoping he goes to the really huge, huge things because he's, he certainly deserves to. Anyhow, it's a great box set. Anything, anything that Jacob does is, is great. And I'm just loving the stories and I'm hoping we get many more, but Derek is getting older. And I do know he's worked so well with Scott. I'm not. I'm not sure what the future holds for the War Master, but yeah, anything that he's done already, it's worth getting hold of. Wave farewell to the land, to the dry, anchors away, and let's hope we don't die. <laughs> From Big Finish Productions, the War Master, solitary confinement. 
I was in a war. There are a lot of them about. Yeah, they're very popular at the moment. And you were fighting in it? Uh, fighting? I'm not sure, but I was caught up in it. You may be harbouring, wittingly or unwittingly, a wanted fugitive and suspected war criminal known as the Master. You are a curious man, aren't you? I'd even go so far as to say that you are horrid. Oh, I'm definitely that. I'm the one who can come for you when you think you're safe. Attention all wardens. All cells are to be secured. I repeat, all cells are to be secured. I'm the one who can destroy your life without effort. Or even knowing who you are. Uh, let me out! Now there's no running away from this. Why are you doing this to me? Because you need to face the truth. This is a trick. This can't be real. I am the master. And everyone will obey me. Eventually. Big finish for the love of stories. I think I'll move on to my number two. Brilliant. Uh, which is a number three, the third release in uh, the Once and Future series. So this was a, a seven episode arc that spanned the 60th anniversary year and culminated in November with two releases, I think it was. So this came out in July. Uh, once and Future, A Genius for War, written by Jonathan Morris. It's a Seventh Doctor adventure. Uh, well, kind of a Seventh Doctor, because if you go back and look at our spoilerific episode of Once and Future, yes, I will say it, we spoil everything in our review of Once and Future. So uh, if you don't want to be spoiled, don't listen to it. But uh, if you've heard it and you want to get our thoughts, go by all means, go and do that. So the, the, the story in Once and Future is that the Doctor is degenerating for some reason. So he's in some kind of some future incarnation and is visiting his past lives, occasionally he visits future lives. Uh, but in this case, he lands in the seventh doctor's body. And um, he is recruited by the Time Lords because, uh, well, not recruited, the Time Lords get an offer from Davros uh, to uh, uh, for help, but he wants the doctor uh, to rescue him. So from the, uh, from the, from the car from the is it the Khalid prison planet Falcus where he's located uh so there's Khalids running around and there's uh you know sort of for a while there I was thinking what's going on with these Khalids what's what's happening but the story becomes clear later on and as we said Jonathan Morris a very reliable writer does a great story and the voices in this oh this blows me away not only for the story which is a great story but the voices the combination of voices Sylvester McCoy and Terry Malloy together, beautiful. Mm. Uh, Beth Chalmers and Ken Bones, love those two together. Ken Bones is just like, like honey to my ears. I can listen to his voice all day long. So for me, this is my favourite story, individual story from the Once and Future set. Most of the stories you can listen to as standalone, but they do have that, that arc that goes through them. Um, so that is my pick, uh, a genius for war. I don't know if you guys have a standout from Once in the Future and whether this is it. I'm echoing what you say. This was, I think, my favourite individual part. I think that it's, uh, and you say the performances are great and it's just it's Johnny Morris uh, just doing lovely things. I mean, I think Falcus was originally mentioned in, I think it was a Marks and Spencer's Dalek special back in around 1977 which carried a reprint of the Genesis of the Daleks novel, uh, novelization, and Falcus was first mentioned there as one of the moons of Scarrow, and uh, Johnny's taken I think he had it in his um, one of his big finish plays as well. I could be wrong saying that. His, uh, his one with uh, the Colin Baker and uh, Napoleon. So, yeah, I'm sure that was a mention there. But yeah, just Not the Curse of Davros, place. was that? The Curse of Davros, thank you. Yes, which introduced Flip. But yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Wonderful. I introduced Flip as a full time companion. To just make mm. sure I've got my facts right there. But yeah, it's a great release. It's there's an awful lot going on, and yeah, it's it's definitely one of those ones you listen to and you think I enjoyed that. I'm going to give that another listen very very soon after, which I did. Still need to do the full once in future listen. Your guy, you guys' episode on it was great, by the way. Really enjoyed it. So yeah, I will. Yeah, do you know what? I might start downloading that when this call's done and do the full once in future experience. It's worth doing. I, I did the whole thing in one go. Uh, you know, I did it once a month, and I said, I'm getting old. 
I, I forgot what happened the previous month, but listen to them all in a row. It really made them so much better. This was probably my standout. The Two's Company is the other one in that series that oh, I yes. really yep. love as well. Because yep. it, yeah, that, that, that actually yeah, all of them had all of them had straight great elements. Um, but yeah, this this is this is pretty astounding. Okay, that brings us to our number ones. Kenny, what have you got for your <laughs> for your number one pick? Well. Following up from what we were discussing a few minutes back when we were talking about Anasty, I've gone for In the Bleak Midwinter mm -hmm. because this was just such a great release. It brings together things that I love. I love Christmas and I love The Eighth Doctor. I love Charlie Pollard and I'm very quickly growing to love Audacity. So here we had three fantastic stories, 24 Doors in December by John Dorney, The Empty Man by Tim Foley and Winter of the Demon by Roy Gill. And I am slightly biased because I was at the recording of The Empty Man and that was an amazing day, just seeing everybody at work and getting to catch up with India and getting to meet Jay and just having a wonderful time to start of feeling festive. Even though it was April, there was bizarrely a Christmas atmosphere about it all. It's, it's hard to put into words uh, just how it was, it's just magical. Is that, but Is that what you're talking about in the June editorial of Vortex? Yes. You're, you're scouting about that? Saying, That's oh, exactly what it was. That's exactly what it was. And I had an well remembered. No, I was reading it today. I was reading it today. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you see um, behind. Yeah, well, that's all right. Hey, I know that things take a wee while from reaching here to Australia in the post, yeah. but uh, <laughs> there are electronic copies available. www.bigfinish.com forward slash vortex. I was, just catching up with my, I was just catching up with my July releases, rereading some of the articles to refresh okay. my memory for but today's yes, episode. But yeah, I, I thought that yep. was and that was funny. I've, <laughs> yeah, I've got my signed scripts in the cupboard behind me, which your YouTube viewers can see. And uh, yeah, I should, should have. Uh, anyway, uh, great box set. I mean, there's Dorney's story starts off and it's sort of looking at the, the tough life that actors have and particularly around Christmas time. And uh, yeah, you do feel for the various people involved, and it's a wonderful, wonderful mix. Particularly, Jason Watkins is outstanding as Alan Orton, the down in his luck Santa Claus, and yes. uh, really enjoyed that. There's <laughs> and there's so much fun in there, and a lot of John Dorney, the writer's research, came from speaking to people who played Santa, including the guy who was book in Ish, Murray Treadwell was one of it. He's a regular Santa Claus. Um, Empty Man, just wonderful, wonderful story with um, Elridge Brinkwood, the character played by Nicholas Grace, sort of a writer wanting to tell stories at Christmas and then finding that stories are after him. And he gets a wonderful happy ending, which it did. listening to it in studio, it was, it was quite hard sort of following it at that point. And then just hearing it come together, it's like, there we go, that's it, it's what I hope to be. And then we get Winter of the Demon by Roy Gill, who... I'm not biased because he's one of my oldest mates and the fact that the story's set in Edinburgh, but it's a great story. And obviously uh, people who know the film Night of the Demon may find some familiar elements in there, mm. but it's a wonderfully spooky story. And, you know, there's some great real life things in there. Um, in like the, the statue of the lion from Roman era that was found down by the sea yeah. uh, or down by the, the river in Edinburgh and the River Forth. Um, and we've chatted about that on uh, episode 7.8 of Pieces of Eighth, Plug Plug. And uh, yeah, it's it's just a wonderful box set. And it really had me sort of in the mood for the festive season because it was cold and it was wet. I mean, as I speak to you, I'm looking at my window. The, it's, the skies are grey and the rain's absolutely hammering down. Whereas unlike you two who are enjoying the, the warmth and the heat, uh, I'm not. This is a typical Scottish winter's day. It's also a typical Scottish summer's day, except it's probably about <laughs> 10 degrees warmer. So, yeah, it, honestly, this box set is wonderful. I love the dynamic with Charlie and Audacity. The fact that yep. they, they're not rive, there's, they're not sort of rivals for the doctor's attentions. They're very much... It's a sisterly relationship, very quickly established. And I mean, the fact that that's established at the end of Audacity, you realise they are going to get on, which is great because that's, well, there can be a place for for squabbling in the TARDIS. Probably, you know, so we'd rather people got on and had fun because if they're having fun, we're going to have fun along with them. And all in all, a wonderful box set. And yeah, it's, it's one that I'll be adding to my 
Christmas playlists and Christmases to come when uh, Chimes of Midnight is lucky to be accompanied by so many great Christmas stories these days for the Eighth Doctor. Yeah, I, I think um, Odessa is just an amazing character and I, I fell in love with her straight away. And it's nice having companions that you want to spend time with and who want to be with the Doctor. And, yeah, and Big Finish has fallen into the trap a bit, a bit recently with you know, some Big Finish companions who you just don't particularly like much. And so it was so nice, refreshing having Audacity come in. And as you say, her and India together are just amazing and their the voices are, are spectacular. Um, I don't listen, to, I don't read the credits or anything before I listen to stories. I get surprised by them. But it was interesting. Actually, I mentioned John Dorney already with the, when I was listening to the robots with John Dorney, I, I didn't know it was a John Dorney. And that you had these, you had these, as I said, just the two hand, I went, oh, it's a John Dorney. And then listening to this as it's going on, and it's door one, door two, door three, um, that because every scene is a different door, but it jumps around and gives you a whole month. And it just is, uh, uh, yeah, I think when door three, I'm going, oh, this has to be John Dorney. Like you, you just tell, he just loves experimenting with form and just how he does that. And, and he does that in that story. But what I love is these three stories all had a point for being Christmas time, which I didn't get to the end. And so it's actually is the TARDIS deliberately doing something to actually, uh, it all falls together so well, joined together. Yeah, I'm so excited by this TARDIS crew being together again because yeah, India and the Eighth Doctor is my favourite period and having them back together again and having the, the Eighth Doctor being fun and carefree again, not having gone through the trials of losing, losing Lucy and all that's happened to him since then, it's just lovely. So I'm just... Yeah, I'm, it just it's like a warm cuddle, this Doctor with with um with Charlie and Audacity, and I'm looking forward to more coming out next year. You are a hugger too, aren't you, Philip? I am a hugger, so yes, I've got I've got the cuddle. You're a hugger you like too, it? are you, Kenny? I'm a massive hugger. I love hugs. I spend most of my time <laughs> at Gallifrey hugging. <laughs> <laughs> From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who: The Eighth Doctor Adventures. In the bleak midwinter. Merry Christmas. I hate Christmas. It isn't a Baker Street Christmas without the Baker Street Advent calendar. Every day in December, you open a new door. They're all numbered, see? One a day until you reach Christmas Eve. I keep seeing things, hearing things. But why would you hallucinate us? Who is this stumbling fellow? I can't quite... Ah! Don't look at it, Eldridge, behind me. His face! Run! Is the figure following you? Like a dead man lurching to his grave. Oh, I think late Victorian, 1880-something, quickly. The solstice, December 21st. Will you be in Edinburgh long? Winter burnings. Seventh victim discovered, his body consumed by a mysterious conflagration. The demon strikes again. What did you make of his hands? One clasped, the other outstretched, as if warding something off. God of fire. What audacity says is true. You will burn, this city will burn, and then the whole planet. The ultimate scorched earth policy. It can't be what he wants. You tell ghost stories on the radio. I love that sort of thing. Big finish for the love of stories. All right, Philip, hit us with your number one. Well, it's not my number one, but it's the last one in the year. This is, this is September that I'm doing. Um, I've just I've just worked through month by month. I'm not putting mine in order. Um, Gallifrey War Room Maneuvers uh, is going to be my final choice. Um, I've always loved Gallifrey from the very start. I love Lou Jamison. She knows that. <laughs> no secrets there. Um, I really have enjoyed this box set because it actually has gone back to the politics of the original couple of seasons. I think what I really enjoyed about the first three seasons of Gallifrey in particular, way, way back, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago, uh, when Gary Russell first started off, was it was all about political politics 
and the interplay between characters and the nastiness of the politics. And this box set actually gets back to that feeling again because there's a lot of nasty politics going on with the different characters. And I've enjoyed that. Um, now, that being said, um, Catherine Armitage does the first and the last story, and those two stories are really one um, because the themes for one take up from the, into the last one. And, and those, two sto- those two stories are just amazing and thrilling and exciting, um, really worth having listened to. Um, these are Blast Them Up, Run Around, Shoot Them Up, um, Remnants by Georgia Cook, which is a, just a fun sort of blast them sort of thing. Um, and then there's also one called Transference by Fio Trethaway, um, where I think Marvin gets to give his best performance, the actor Sean Carlson, um, we see him at his most emotional. Um, and I know, and I don't think Kenny liked it quite as much as I did, um, but I actually really, I actually really like in terms of, of um, Sean Carlson's performance and being able to actually take that character a bit further in terms of the emotional journey. Because throughout the, you know, the years and years of Gallifrey, um, Narvin hasn't had much range to do emotionally, really. It's a, it's a sort of rare thing. And he actually managed to actually you know, do some stuff at this time. There's some lovely like, little conceits in terms of, you know, there's a rebel, kind of a rebel movement happening on, on Gallifrey and Narvin, and there's all this politics happening. Ken Bones is great. Um, it's, it's, you do need to listen to the first one in terms of the first war room. And once again, even all, it, Gallifrey just keeps building on itself all the time. So it probably is a hard one to just fall into, though there are some adventures in there that you could probably get away with. But yeah, really worth thinking about getting into the Gallifrey series. And this continues that, that spell really well. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I think so Cat Armitage's opener and you know, first and fourth stories just outstanding stories of a set. They're just. They're what you would want. They're they're old still. They're old school Gallifrey, yeah. But but Gallifrey, old school Gallifrey plus would probably be a, a good way to describe it with with some of the neuron going elements of Elf the Time War. But yeah, it's you're very very good. And uh, yeah, Cat absolutely is a a good writer for this range. And fingers crossed, we'll get more from her. Yeah, I love Cat's writing. She's re- really hits yeah so many emotional levels and really great character work. Um, I'm, I'm surprised we don't see a bit more of it, actually, because yeah, but everything we get from it is always good quality. Rain, what are you, you going to finish off with your yes, last one? My number one uh, is the second Doctor Adventures, James Robert mm. McCrimmon. The big tragedy for the first and second Doctor box sets in my mind is we only get one of them a year, um, and this was a this was a great one building on the previous years uh, beyond. War Games, uh, which sort of set the scene for the doc, the second Doctor, uh, working for the Celestial Intervention Agency. In this one, the opening story uh, sets up Jamie, uh, an older, a physically older Jamie, and how his memory block uh, gets sort of uh, taken back and can start travelling with the Doctor again. Uh, the second story, and that was written by Mark Wright, the second story... Uh, called The Green Man, written by Paul F. Verhoeven. Uh, we spoke to Paul about that on the podcast, so you can go back and check that out. He's a very energetic Australian guy who I'm sure has got more big Finnish stuff coming. Um, but this was a, a crinoid story, and it was set uh, sort of based on uh, themes that you get in uh, Rear Window. So uh, he was a, a huge Hitchcock fan and wanted to inject some of those elements in there. Really interesting what they do with uh, with with some of the plot there, uh, and the shroud by Bob Ayres. So Bob Ayres is being used a little bit in the first and second Doctor Rangers now. I think this might be his second or third story. I know he did uh, he did the Demon Song earlier in the year for the first Doctor box set, which itself is good, but I I've got to choose only five. So. Um, I couldn't include the the first Doctor box set, which I really love as well. Uh, but the Shroud by Bob Ayres, when the trailer for this box set came out, um, I thought that this might have been an, uh, a Nestine story because there's uh, there's Nestine sound effects and sounds in there. But it uh, and, and the alien invaders are called squids, so it kind of it tricked me into thinking it might have been Nestines, which it wasn't. But uh, they kind of flash forwards those scenes that are 
that are involving the um, the, the sound effects that tricked me there. Uh, but Michael Troughton is superb uh, as the Doctor, uh, just keeps getting better and better. This was my, not that this happens to be my number one pick out of the list, doesn't mean I've ranked at number one, Philip. Uh, but I also picked the second Doctor as my number one for 2022 as well. So uh, the second Doctor has had a great showing with the Dead Star early in the year in the audio novel and this one. Uh, a brilliant box set. Uh, wonderful uh, two-part stories, which I'm really getting into. Um, the the sound designer that is, um, is uh, being used... Oh, well, there was three different sound designers on, on this set. So Andy Harwick, uh, Toby Rychek Robinson, and uh, Mark Hendrick. Uh, actually, Andy Hardwick and Mark Hendrick might have done sound design together. You might be able to correct me on that, Kenny. I'm not too sure off the top of my head, I'm afraid, but I, I can yeah. give you useless trivia about Bob Ayers. And yeah, go on. His brother is Mark Ayers, the musician. Oh, okay. They are related. Yep. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, a very good set. That is my, well, one of my favourites of the year. These are all five of them are my favourites of the year. Um, but I don't know what you boys are thinking of the second Doctor boxes. Really in loving them. Um, I think that if you're setting them after the war games, I think it sort of, it makes things a lot easier in terms of, you know, potential recasts and things like that whilst some cast members here. I don't quite know what the plans are going forward. You know, with the regards to the likes of Ben and Polly, Victoria, Zoe. But here at least we've got Jamie, still Jamie, the one and only Fraser Hines. And uh yeah, they're they're wonderful, just that ongoing story. And you can tell there's a real fondness and friendship between Michael and Fraser. And sort of, you know, very much echoing Patrick and Fraser and yeah, they're just as wonderful. And to say this, you know exactly who Michael's playing. It's not a your exact perfect vocal impression, but it's again, it's a fully rounded performance and that natural timbre to the voice and mm. quality to it is, you know, that trout and quality that the boys both possess. And it's just lovely to hear and a great ongoing season. Like yourself, I wish there were more of a year, but sadly not at the moment. Yeah. And once again, holding Fraser back from the first box set was the right thing to do. It, it sort of built a bit of anticipation and, yeah, bringing him in now was, was good and strong. Yeah. Also gave us the opportunity for that little teaser from the previous year within the Annihilators as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's my number. That's, that's our top fives uh, that we've, uh, that we've chosen uh, between the three. I think we should probably mention some, um, some honorable mentions. Um, as I said, the first Dr. Box set, the Demon Song came out earlier in the year, and if there is a cover, that is probably my favourite cover of the year. It's this one. It is absolutely beautiful. If I could have that, without the graph, without the uh, uh, words on it, that would I would hang that on the wall. That is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Um, Wasn't it Chris Naylor who did that? I I'm think sure it might be. Twitter and Wouldn't ask him to. You could. I think you can buy. It was from. It was. I could get Chris. that from Chris actually. Yeah, he'd do that for us. Yeah, I should ask him. Be a while before I get home, though, so I'll, I'll wait till I get home and then see. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, uh, Stephen Noonan is brilliant as the first Doctor, so different to the other recast that we've had um, and works really well with with uh, Lauren Cornelius as Dodo. Um, yeah, get it, stepping into the modern era in this box set, so... Um, in uh, the modern era for us, so stepping into the 2020s, which is a really interesting dynamic for the first Doctor and companion from the from the 60s. So uh, yeah, I can recommend that one. Another honourable mention for me would be um, the third Doctor Adventures, uh, which was released in February. The the um, return of Joe Jones, Joe Jones, yeah, a magnificent performance from Katie. Particularly the standout performance to me is when she's talking about Cliff. And we know that she's also talking about Stuart at the same time. You can hear the emotion in her voice. Um, if you go back, you can uh, to, to our recent interview with Nick Briggs on the light at the end. I think it's on the light at the end. She might have been talking about, uh, he might have been talking about that take where she did that impromptu. Um, no, it's not, not impromptu, but ad-libbed that uh, performance. It was absolutely beautiful. 
Um, and I just love the the three different stories in that set. Um, another notable mention, which has already been mentioned by Kenny so far, The Box of Terrors, which is a recent release, which is the the audio novel by Lizzie Hopley, which is the two Sarah Janes, uh, so with the fourth Doctor and the third Doctor uh, and Omega. Um, the only reason I didn't put that in is because I haven't finished it yet, so I'm still in the middle of it and loving every minute of it. John Colshaw is an absolute genius when it comes to his audiobook readings. And last but not least, for a notable mention for me, I, I can't go past mentioning UFO, Breaking Point, which is mm. the second box set for the UFO series. Um, and sadly, I believe it's the last. Uh, that's what I've heard anyway, the last for the time being. And if you're a fan of Jerry Anderson's UFO, this is a must-have. It goes a little bit deeper into the characters. Uh, it sort of modernises a little bit, but not too much. And Barnaby Kay's performance as a striker is sensational. We've got Samuel Clements in there um, as uh, Colonel Freeman. So in stepping in front of the microphone instead of behind as a, as a director, as he has done quite often. Um, and a Jeannie Spark as as Lieutenant Lake as well. So um, the sound design on on these Jerry Anderson uh, shows is just brilliant. And it, it just takes me right back to the TV series. And, I, and But but I love I kind of love these audios more. They're, they're meatier than, than say, the TV series. You don't need to be a fan of the, the TV series if you just like good stories. This to this. Yeah, but if you are, you're going to hear all those same sounds. It's going to yeah. take you right back. Yeah, but don't let that stop you. If you haven't seen the TV series, well, don't I, I let it stop you. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen the TV series. I've really mm. loved the two box sets. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I've been meaning to go. I mean, I've been meaning to go back to the box. I've been meaning to go back to the TV series. I just haven't done it. Yeah, ones that yeah. have been doing like the shorter releases from Anderson as well. Uh, the big finish released things like the Stingray and um, Fireball XL Five. The releases have done there. They've been very, very good with covers in the style of the old TV Century Twenty One LPs. And they are, yeah, they're great. Just very, very enjoyable. And I would recommend those as well. Mm. Sorry, right, this, so these are still your picks, Dwayne. Sorry, I'm not that, trying that, to muscle in. My notable mind. mentions. Um, Philip, have you got any notable mentions? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Lots. Um, I want to throw in the Ninth Doctor, the Shades of Fear box set in February. Um, Ninth Doctor's always been very consistent. I've said none of us brought one up. He sets up. He's always, his stuff is really consistent. I'm really been enjoying Christopher Eccleston being back. Um, yep, so I, I, that I had Return of Joe Jones too. Oh, The Avengers, Steve and Tara King in March. I'm loving the cartoon adventures um, with, with The Avengers. They are just so well done and put together. Um, I'm also going to put together a box set, the Blake 7 Origin box set of books, which can I say cost an absolute fortune to get shipped out to Australia. I think it costs more for the postage than it did for the books. Um, but I'm so ridiculous. glad I have them. <laughs> it is ridiculous. But really, really glad I have them because those uh, seven books, I think how many they are? Um, yeah, I think it's seven. It's seven, yeah. Um, actually, I finished the James Goss one this week. Um, I've just been reading one every now and then. The, the way that the authors, because they've had the, they've had Terry Nation's original scripts as well as the TV scripts, the way they've been able to actually incorporate Terry Nation and some of his other ideas into them, but also how they've filled out the different characters. James Goss has just done his last, I just finished his books, all in first person. So each chapter is a different first person. But he does stuff for Zen and for Aurac, the computers, and what they're thinking. And it is just so cleverly done. Um, and just the way they have enlarged the canvas um, by backstories, a lot like Malcolm Hulk, Hulk did in, with his cave monsters and his books. You've just got more backstory happening and even a few extra characters thrown in the storylines, which is what apparently Terry originally had with his scripts. They've been great. Um, Fifth Doctor Conflict Interest we talked about, Purity Unleashed. Um, the stuff that you guys have got. Oh, the Amiga Factor. So lovely to have the house that wasn't haunted. Um, have the Amiga Factor come back. Lou Jamison and um, John Dorney acting in it. Um, terrifying, can I just say? Really terrifying. I think we another Tim Foley of, script. Another Tim Foley script. Yep. And the sound design is its own character. So we did, we did, we actually did a special on that. You can go back and listen to. We had Lou and John come in, um, but the sound design is its own character because it, it plays such an important role. Um, 
Yeah, that, and we already talked about the eighth doctor stuff. It's it was a good year, not a bad year. Big finish. Actually, it's I actually think it was probably one of the most consistent years that they've done for a long time in terms of just the quality of what was coming out. Which makes it really difficult to pick, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Other years, there's some real standouts that are just spectacular, spectacular. But there's been just this level of really strong consistency. Kenny, what about your honourable mentions? Yeah, well, I've got, and this seems to be the house that wasn't haunted from Omega Factor, which I actually finished re-listening to yesterday because I had that on in my some morning walks. I fancied a wee change. I wanted a wee break from Doctor Who and thought, go for something a bit creepy and... And Natasha Gerson, who plays Morag, now as a as a friend of mine, and uh, she's obviously makes a wee appearance in there as well. And it's that last te- that well. last ten minutes is terrifying. Yes, the last ten minutes absolutely. is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, uh, I've also got on you know, the Living Doctor Chronicles, which is just so good as a range. Ah, yeah. I think it's once we've got the final batch of stories. It'll be this, I mean, to me, it'll feel like one big block. So this time next year, I'm probably be recommending the final batch. Um, I've got a good idea what happens in these. I don't I haven't actually read the scripts, but I've got a good idea what happens. And uh, I'm really excited to hear it. And what they've done is just been fantastic. Safi Ingar is brilliant. And, um, and without, it goes without saying, as you said earlier, what Jake does is the Living Doctor. Fabulous. I've also got, uh, even though it had been released um Four years ago, Terror of the Master was given a standalone release on its own last year. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Baxendale's uh, audiobook, which is great, or enhanced audiobook, great sound design in there. Uh, also, but that only goes for that one only goes for about four, three and a half to four hours, as opposed to your eight hour standard yes. audio book. So it's a lot shorter. If you want a taste of the audio novels, get that because it's a lot shorter. Uh, but absolutely too. brilliant by John mm. Colshaw once again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I've- He's superb. I, you know, I was quite lucky. I got to hang out with John when he was up in Edinburgh doing a show in August. And I went along, got to hang out with him afterwards. It was great. He just said, yeah, come on into the green room. I texted him say, and just said, come on through. And he's such a good guy, John. He just loves his big finish, loves his cult TV and film. And, you know, he's just he's just an absolute sweetheart. And he just makes me laugh. He's one of the funniest people that I've ever met. And he just he just slips into that like, Donald Trump voice and or whatever he's saying. And he'll do... <laughs> Um, he'll do like Doctor Who speeches in these, you know, the voices of Doctor Who char- or, or in real world characters. They're just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, but my other one that I haven't mentioned is The Wizard of Time, uh, again by Roy yeah. Gill. Now, this one came out in the summer. I was actually in holiday in Lanzarote. So, in weather akin to what you guys have just now. So, listening to this was uh, rather interesting, sort of in the heat. Uh, but it's just a, a wonderful story. Um, got. An old writer again. There's something about old writers this year that the big finish have done rather well. And uh, here we've got Jacob Harmer um, with his in fact his novels for children of generation, a bit like um, a Tolkien sort of person. And uh, and then we wonder if his stories are real, how much are fancy, played by Ronald Pickup in one of his last roles before he passed. So yeah, for wonderful story and just. Couldn't, couldn't recommend it enough. And Tom Baker and Lou Jameson are on top, top notch mm-hmm. for him. And of course, we've got Margaret Ho- we've got Margaret Hobbard in there played by Neris Hughes as well. So yeah, and like to say, it's been a great year. There's been some a consistently high standard, which has made it really hard to pick releases because going through the list of everything that came out, I must have taken, you know, my list changed. Some of these ones that I've just mentioned were on the list and then I've taken others off. Um, and for example, The Ark wasn't originally on there, but I thought in terms of historical interest, that actually mm. got my interest peaked, and I thought, therefore, that deserves a mention. If not for you know the actual storyline, John Dorney did a great job with what was there. So, no, sorry, it was Johnny Morris, and um, yeah, just did a good job with what was there and to make something interesting out of something that was not particularly dramatic in the original. So, yeah, great year, and uh, yeah, twenty twenty four has been off to a great start already with what we've had so far, and uh, yeah. I just hope it had uh, the great the great and Tyrone War, fantastic. Absolutely. It's one of my I mean it's one I've I listened to that twice in the day of release and I never do that. <laughs> I'm not biased because Lizzie and Conrad are two friends, but it's just a great release. So so good. And of course the first torch would do the year is out as well with Pop It. And oh my goodness. I'm saying no more. Zip. <laughs> 
What else are you looking forward to this year, Kenny? Some of the things that I know that are coming up are going to be really, really interesting. Uh, what's happening for the Eighth Doctor? Some uh, exciting. How, how do I how do I word it? Well, what's going to go on to the, the Seventh Doctor? I think the second part of the Last Day is going to get very, very interesting, um, given the way things have been set up. And I think there's some real treats on the way. And yeah, there's. I, I'm I'm mean, I'm really enjoying it. I think we're in the fact that the different ranges of different producers has really sort of opened things up. So I mean, absolutely nothing against David Richardson when he oversaw you know previous Doctors ranges, but I think having different producers with different ideas and different inputs and you know different life experiences and what they want to put into their stories and things like that, I think it is is a great thing. So I'm really looking forward to finding out. Even the thing, I mean, there's plenty that I don't know, and yeah, looking forward to seeing what happens next with each and every single one of them. So yeah, it's going to be interesting times, places and spaces. Mm -hmm. Very good. Philip, did you have any final thoughts on either 2023 or what's ahead for 24? No, I'm exhausted about thinking about 2024 already. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, that, I, I would say, I think, I think 2023, it, it always is hard knowing you know, what to choose because there's been so much good stuff to choose from. Um, but yeah, just trying to keep my listing up, it's hard work because there's so much coming out. But worthwhile. Very good. Any final so thoughts we should, Dwayne? Well, we should come up with some recommendations, shouldn't we, Philip? No, I'm just joking. You know I'm joking. <laughs> I think we've done that. <laughs> All right. So um, next week on the podcast, we are going to be speaking with uh, a, a writer who we've never spoken with before. We took a clip from this and put it into an episode a couple of months back, but the full interview is coming out with Eddie Robson. So that was fascinating to, to chat with him. And uh, that will be coming out next week. So until then, Kenny, it's been great to have you back with us uh, to do this. We missed you last year. You couldn't make it last year. So it's been far, far too long. Yes, let's catch up again soon. And uh, yes, let's uh, chew all things audio. Since between the three of us, we know a, a little bit about what's going on and, and what's been thing. done. Very good. And uh, Philip, thank you so much for being here and uh, being awake. Yeah, no, I'm doing well. <laughs> I am looking forward to bed, though. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. All right, until then, until next time, we'll catch you later. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 186, the best of Big Finish 2023, with our guests Kenny Smith and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. More about us and tickets to Wendy Padbury Live in Sydney and Melbourne in February 2024 from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to give us your feedback or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time. <laughs>